So welcome to the first podcast um, for the Harmony Alliance, the Harmony Empowers Initiative. And uh, this really important panel today is going to be exploring issues of personal and professional development and leadership, identity. The theme is connecting with self, identity, belonging and leadership. Um, and record, we were recording this uh, amazing event in Melbourne at the Moroccan Soup Cafe. Is that what it's, yeah? Moroccan Soup Bar, that'll do, Cafe Moroccan Soup, Soup Bar um, in, in Melbourne. And um, thank you to um, Hannah for hosting us today. Today we have three panel members. Um, on my left we have Hannah Asafiri. Um, and then we have Wessa Chow and Bianca Elmir. I'll just spend a few minutes introducing, getting them to introduce themselves um, to, to you today. So Hannah, if you'd like to go first, say a little bit about who you are and your journey. Um, look, thankfully, uh, thank you for uh, what I think is not only a timely event, uh, speaking uh, and articulating the experiences and the embodied examples for refugee and migrant women. But I do think importantly, before proceeding with any event, uh, the importance to acknowledge that we are tussling and existing on lands that have not been ceded by First Nations people. And that that is a responsibility that we take and it informs everything we express and articulate, no matter our causes. And there are many and we are marginalised and we're tussling with the hostility that is levelled at Muslims in particular at the moment that uh, notwithstanding those experiences, that we are benefactors of being on lands that have not been ceded, and with that we, we are afforded the responsibility that comes with that um, as people living in the margins of, of uh, these circumstances. So that is just something that informs everything we say. My name is Hanna Safiri, and I'm... Um, I mean, without delving too much into the specificity, I'm somebody who uh, works with um, the enabling or the empowerment of Muslim women. My, my personal journey has been shaped by adversity and trauma, and through that has, have developed a, a profound sense of justice, and justice that does not seek to be legitimated by men and or the outside world or decorum or expectation, but rather a sense of justice where uh, one refers back inward as a woman and as a woman who finds her empowerment back inside the principles of Islam. Now, with that, have established a, um, a hospitality setting or platform through which we afford practical uh, steps to enable the same for uh, women and in particular Muslim women to circuit break that cycle of disadvantage not only through employment, but also through education, advocacy, so that they then become the champions of the very causes that have left them disadvantaged in the first place. One other thing I want to say is that the times and the climate around us that we're navigating at the moment, it has changed and it has become much more hostile in particular, um, not only uh, anti-minorities and against migrants, but in particular it's reinforced by an Islamophobia sentiment. And that those ideas translate to Muslim women bearing the brunt of trying to live in spaces with autonomy and with a sense of safety, all the while trying to find embodied examples of how to be the best version of ourselves. Yeah. So that's just a little bit about um, context and, and what yeah. we do. Thank you. We'll come, we'll come back to some of those really important themes. I'd now like to introduce Wessa Chow, who's the CEO of Cultural Intelligence and co-founder of Belonging from the Inside Out. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you came into the work that you're doing. What was your driver? Yeah, so my name is Wessa Chow and uh, I've been in many, many diff different situations and scenarios where I've been the only <coughs> woman, I've been the only culturally diverse person, or sometimes I'm the youngest person in the room, um, often in many settings. Um, and through those experiences, I've started to understand the strength of being different and the strength of having different diverse perspectives and what that could bring to any discussions and different settings. So I've uh, been, been to a lot of uh, consulting seminars, um, uh, workshops, 
bringing all these different perspectives um, and hence because of those experiences I decided to start my own consulting company cultural intelligence where I provide um, research and using using culturally sensitive ways of designing research uh, methodologies but also being able to um, bring insights that are normally not um, uh, explored in those research um, and also consulting um, organisations and help them understand the power of cultural diversity and providing training as well. So Ooh. helping people understand um, how do we work with people from different cultural backgrounds and how do we uh, also bring on board customers that they may not be exposed to as well because we are, Australia is now becoming much more multicultural um, and it's also, uh, and when I talk about multicultural, it's not just necessarily about established organisations needing to access, say, the Muslim community or the you know Chinese community or the Vietnamese community, but we're talking about cross-cultural communities as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, how do we, you know, work with the Chinese community to help them, enable them to work with Indigenous communities or, you know, African communities as well. Great, thank you. Um, our third uh, on the panel today is Bian Bianca Elmir, and we will have all of their CVs up um, online to look at because I, we're only getting a snapshot. People are very shy about talking about the awards that they've got, the recognition that they've got, and the support that they've got, not just in the national arena, but at the grassroots as well. And uh, Bianca, I couldn't do your CV justice because you've done so much, but you tell us from your own words, what are, what are some of the things that you've done and what has brought you to what you're doing now in your career? Yep, so um, my name is Bianca and I really enjoy smashing stereotypes and I've um, tried to live that out in different ways. Uh, probably the most current thing that I'm doing at the moment and I've spent a lot of time doing that is um, working quite hard in boxing and I'm the current Australian boxing professional champion. Wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, soon to be Asia Pacific champion and world champion. That's the goal. <laughs> set. So um, yeah, I've, I, I spend quite a lot of time working in, in, uh, in my sporting career. I also mentor young boys across New South Wales. Um, so I'm a facilitator for an all boys program and we teach concepts of healthy masculinity um, and what it is to be in touch with your emotions and respect women and understand um, their place in the world as well mm. in a more, mm. yeah, in a more positive light. Uh, yeah, and I guess I've just I've done several other things recently. I was just a, a stunt double for a, a TV series, just on SBS, mm. <laughs> where I just did, um, I did all the fight scenes for the main actress, which was really exciting. And um, I choreographed the other fights as well, which is a hyper-masculine thing to, you know, uh, that, Often the perspective around that is that you have to be a man to do those things, but mm -hmm. I really exactly. liked particularly smashing that stereotype. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So the theme there of smashing stereotypes is really important. And for those of you looking today, um, we always say I just, we have to take the just out yeah. and use the word I, because uh, it, it's an enormous challenge around how we, how we describe the, the work that we've done. But I was going to ask the panel now, if, again, being reminded that the people watching this are people from migrant refugee backgrounds, women. Um, what are a couple of the things that you would say have been important in your leadership challenge that has empowered you to continue with that leadership challenge? What are a couple of those things that have grounded you, given you the capacity to, to move forward and do the work that you're doing because you are smashing stereotypes, you're leading, you're using energy, you're multi-skilling, you're doing all these things. What was a couple of things we could share with people that have really empowered you and enabled you to do what you do? Hannah. Um, so for me, I, I know for most people would find what I'm about to say shocking, um, reclaiming an understanding of Islam mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. finding that it spoke to not only my capacity to reason and uh, my foundational belief of human rights and social justice, but it also enabled uh, me to validate my own sense of intuition yeah. um, as a woman that, um, that the reason and intuition have equal standing in my understanding of Islam. 
And the other, I guess, uh, element and component, um, and when I say Islam, it's so problematic because it's so, so associated with all the negativity and the stereotypes and the barbarism and it's at odds with anything we even imagine uh, to be a positive representation of civility and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and I know that, that to be true across the globe. So when you look at examples of Islam, there is not one, not one that can showcase um, some of the values that I'm talking about. Mm. Now, with that said, as a woman, revisiting and reclaiming that understanding and finding legitimacy meant that I don't seek legitimacy from men. Mm. They don't need to legitimate me as a woman, mm. nor what I believe to be right and wrong uh, or acceptable or otherwise. So that was one component of how I came to at the <coughs> crossroads when the entirety of society and its conventions failed me as a young woman growing up through abuses and needing to be quiet around, you know, um, we had a panel the other day around decorum. Absolutely, decorum and conventions um, aren't just white. They, they are and they belong to the maintenance of keeping women in a certain uh, situation. And you, you quickly realise that upholding them simply reinforces that. So yes, there's room to, um, and the need and the necessity to reclaim your own sense of conventions and spaces. And, and the other component for me um, as, a, as a woman kind of also growing up in, and we, we reference multicultural and refugee a lot. And, and I also just want to say that that is also such a diverse and nuanced and the power relations within that and each person is kind of afforded different social standing. So it's not like they're a homogenous group. No, that's right. um, and yet when we endeavour to navigate those spaces and what happens to those of us who are trying to build communities and work with women from the ground up, um, we find that we don't have much mirrored back at us mm. in spaces, whether it be feminist spaces mm. and or uh, the broader society. So for me, I think I said it, uh, a while back that I found allyship in African-American women's writings. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and that yeah. is where yeah. there was a lot of resonance yeah. because it spoke to being on the margins, experiencing a whole host of similar features mm -hmm. and solidifying and standing firm in that belief, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. though it wasn't shared much mm -hmm. by many others. Mm -hmm. um, because often when we are on the margins, we're, we're expected to kind of either be tokenly included mm. um, and or toe mm. the line and behave in mm. certain ways. Mm. There's no room for our nuanced context mm. to mm. genuinely mm. be, not yet. However, there is an appetite and there's certainly movement at the moment. Uh, but the requirement is to back ourselves. How can you back yourself without community, without kind of people standing yeah. behind you? Yeah. Is the tricky yeah. Um, yeah. question. Yeah, and I think the key messages there are about that link to the community and how you back yourself and the writings of women. And I'll use a quote from, and you talked about African-American women, I mean, and Bell Hooks, who's yeah. written about this, that we can use the margins as a site of resistance. So how we are positioned in the margins, but we can use them as a site of resistance and work from that because people are going to put us in the margins anyway. Mm. So we might as well use that as a site to bring about those changes. It's but actually when, liberating to be yeah. in the margins and stop wanting to belong. Yeah. But when I think that when we're together, we are the center stage, yeah. which is even just even more empowering. So thank you for sharing that. It's really beautiful. And what about you? So what's, this, what's empowered you and sustained you in the work that you do when you when you've done it and you've gone out and you've done all that cross cultural awareness and you think, hmm, I had to deal with that today. <laughs> how do you step away from that and go, how do I go back the next day and deal with this? Uh, well, a few things. One, very similar to Hannah, but understanding myself is yeah. um, a, a really key component to it. Understanding my own values, understanding my own identity, and also owning the identity. Yeah. Because um, sometimes being a, a person of minority backgrounds, and especially being a woman as well, 
you think, oh, okay, it must be me that's the problem rather than the system that's the problem. Mm. And so having that strong sense of self and understanding, well, no, this is who I am. And yes, it's different from the mainstream, but that is okay. So understanding, um, having uh, the, the, the strength to be able to understanding where myself is coming from. Um, and hence the belonging um, project and the, that's actually a leadership program to actually help people through that, to, mm. to understand the inner journey yes. Um, yes. and be able to help people having the a strong sense of, um, I know who I am yeah. before yeah. you actually yeah. go out and yeah. step into yeah. difficult spaces often yeah. Yeah. Um, because you're also often only the only person who will understand your own view. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and so sometimes you get blank faces and you're like, okay, well, did they just not understand what I'm saying? Or is it just that, you know, they just don't know how to respond? Mm. And often mm. is that too. So they don't know how to respond. They thought what you said is absolutely great, but then they don't know how to respond. Mm. So you get the blank mm. face. Mm. Um, and then... And then the perception could be, oh, okay, so does it mean that nobody understood what I'm saying here? <laughs> yeah. um, and be able to articulate um, aspects uh, of yourself that is different. And I think um, it took me a while, actually, to have the language to be able to explain what I'm talking about. So even, for example, in the Asian community we, and, and other communities as well, you don't really look people in the eye. Mm. Um, and to be able to explain why that's the case um, is the is the struggle. So you can um, a lot of people actually go out to tell people these stories that many different cultures don't really look people in the fa uh, in the eyes because of respect. But there's more to it as well. Mm. So being ha able to bring that for forward and be able to explain that, and when you start to be able to explain that, people go, oh, okay, well, that makes sense." Not yeah. necessarily meaning that they'll yeah. suddenly accept it, but then at least they understand. They understand it, it yeah. Um, and for me, um, especially when it becomes very stressful, um, I like to play. Like I'm a, I'm a big, you know, like to play like a child. Um, sometimes I, I collect a lot of cultural costumes, and so I, um, you know, sometimes just put them on and have fun with friends. Um, right. Yeah, cultural right. collection of yeah, costumes yeah. And, and also learning how um, you put them on. So I've yeah. got a whole collection of um, yeah. saris mm. and putting them on in different ways and understanding what that means mm. as well. Because mm. once you start understanding the culture and using that for me is a method of understanding another culture as well. Mm. Walking, walking in the shoes. And I think that the key message there um, again is understanding he, who you are. Mm. I mean, um, because ev on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, or often, we are interrogated about who we are. Yes. Complete strangers will come up to you yes. to interrogate who you are because you look different. Yep. And so you have to be grounded in who you are. And the other step further in that is, and what is your worth? Mm. Because we are given worth by other people. We have to establish our own worth. Mm. And I, I like that. That's a really powerful message. So mm. thank you for that. And so, smashing stereotypes um, and, uh, you know, super fit and strong out there. But, you know, what, what keeps you going? What empowers you to keep going? And when you've had that difficult fight or you've had a difficult challenge, um, where do you go for solace and support? Where that grounding is, you know, that foundation? Yeah. And I guess, like... Well, for me, because I, I also come from an Islamic background as well, and it's very dear to me as well. It's something that grounds me, and I'm so grateful for that. It, it provides a moral compass or like gratitude and love, and, and it's, it's very sacred for me. So it's about how, how I can negotiate both my Islamic background, what it is to be a, a female in a male-dominated sport, and all those intersections of identity. And I guess my sense of self has been a painful experience and I just wish that someone told me that growing up you know like okay you're gonna come to the end of yeah. that and have a lot of confidence yeah. but it's gonna be seriously painful yeah. um, and a lot of conflict and internal conflicts and but it is so beautiful at the end and I'd say that my journey has been finding what my values are and I think that that has given me the strength 
to find my authenticity because I don't have to run anyone else's race. If I can identify what my values are, then I can try and live by them. And it gives me permission to feel worthy because I've identified what those values are, not um, systems or other people's expectations or cultural values or all these things that we just get smashed with growing up. And I think that maturity and like growing up is a really beautiful thing because it gives you that confidence. So finding my values, um, trying to live by those values has then given me belonging because then I've tried to shape my life around those values and find my tribe, find jobs that reflect my values, um, find friendships and a community and connection. And I think it's all of those things that give me then the strength to be a leader, even if it's not, you know, I didn't set out to be a leader, I just wanted to be myself, that was it. Mm -hmm. And if that meant like challenging people or all of these stereotypes around what it is to be a woman or what it is to be Muslim, then, um, then I've had to fight against that. And it was never really my choice to do that. I just so desperately wanted to be myself. And in doing that, I guess I have found leadership and it's, I've given permission for other women to break off those chains and whatever internal battles that they're going through. And I think that that's what all leaders do. And it's the unseen leaders that just run their own race every day that give permission for other people to do the same. Mm. And I think it's just so incredibly important mm. when we're rammed with mainstream ideas of what it is to be a good person, you know, propped up by social media or these really polished ideas of what it is to be happy and stuff. And mm. it's all mostly fake. And everyone just wants to be themselves and everyone's a bit weird and it's completely fine. That's yeah, what fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, There I think the, the, the understanding yourself, coming back to yourself and your own values, because at the end of the day, that's what will give you that foundation. Um, you know, we can all go out and play the game and we have to play the game sometimes. You know, I've had to play the game. We all have to do it. But having your eyes on the prize. So what is it you're there for? For me, I used to say... If I can have a revolution every day in my work, I'll have achieved something. Nobody else knows it's a revolution, but I'm going to make it a revolution for change, for women, or for different women, migrant refugee women in particular. So I always had that. So in your leadership, in your leadership journeys, when we're looking at aspiring migrant refugee women who are going to be watching this, what are some of the, you know, I don't talk about strategies necessarily. We've talked about values. We've talked about belief. But what are some of the things. Often people say, give me some tips, Maria. What are some of the things that have assisted you in your leadership um, role in bringing about change? Hmm. I, I just want to, I think, just build on, none of us put our hand up and say, we want to be leaders. Hey, this is us and here's a criteria and a job description and then we follow suit and we get mentored into it. Yeah, yeah. That we, we through... Um, a commitment to subverting the environment that keeps us down have found ourselves in these positions. And more and more, for someone like me, it's that you offer it up as, um, as a proposition and people get behind you. That just reinforces and, to me, re-energises. Um, and especially now, I think there, there is a point, though, about that should never assume that we're equal in this world. Um, the onus is always on those of us who are on the margins, whether it be the queer community, First Nations people, Muslim women, whatever, the yeah. onus is on us to take the rest on a journey, whether we like it or not. And I wish it wasn't so. It's just like I wish we weren't leaders. I yeah. wish we were living in a world that was just and fair and we wouldn't need to speak. Yeah. The reality is we do, and the more the world around us is, has departed from the values of equity and plurality and respect, the more we, unfortunately, have to bear the brunt of taking people on a journey. And if we find that laboursome, it is. If we find it difficult, it is. If we find it stressful, it is. If we find that it puts us and paints us as the go-to person, it is. And we have then a responsibility to make it nuanced and, and to be smarter and to accept. And, and we, we don't have the luxury and privilege to kind of be sensitive about the PC nature of, you know, others can be offended. We can't. If we were offended, nothing changes. Mm. So... Um, what keeps us going for someone like me um, 
is that we are very unconventional. I do our politics and offer it to people over dinner and ask them if they want bread with it. So when, when, when the conversation is around, the national conversation is around climate change, First Nations people, Islamophobia, same-sex marriage debate, I hold the service, the room, ding, 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 and then all of a sudden I think, oh, shit, I better say something clever, and I have no idea what I'm about to say other than the fact that I have convictions about the injustice that's unfolding around us. Mm. And with that, I end up saying something, and most people resonate with it. Mm -hmm. I don't fight people, and I think leadership for me is not responding to the division or to, or, or to people you disagree with. It is, in fact, inviting them to consider something else entirely. Because to, to just react to somebody reinforces their position, which I don't agree with anyway. Mm. And it becomes a waste of energy. I don't know if I've made myself clear around what I mean. But mm, um, so. So, so most people come in to this place. This is hospitality. Never has the host of a hospitality joint held the room to account and said, I'm going to talk politics now. Mm. And you have to deal with the fallout. And sometimes there is. You're dealing with public opinion who aren't used to going out to dinner and talking about social issues. And you get pushback. And sometimes that pushback is even from women mm. who say, excuse me, that's totally inappropriate over dinner. And you just say, well, you pay for the conversation. The dinner's free so, or something. And you have to find humour yes, in important. navigating yeah. around yeah. some of the tensions. Yeah. Yeah. But the onus is always on those on the margins to take the rest of us on a journey and we need to recognise and support them in doing that. Mm, fabulous. Lisa. And just adding on to Hannah's point, um, I'm really passionate about um, having more people be involved in the political process um, because the reality is we will continue to be in the same space if we don't ask for something different. Um, and like Hannah said, it is always the onus is on the people who are on the margins to do that because the established is established. They don't need to change. Um, there is no reason for them to having to change because it works for them. It's, um, it's actually quite comfortable for them, in fact. Um, what we're asking them to do can be uncomfortable. Um, and that's and not I, to say. Can I just yeah. add? And sometimes, in fairness, it's not that it's comfortable and it works for them. Sometimes they actually really don't know. Yes. They don't know. Yes. They just sit and look at you and go, man, I don't know, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. And, but they have to be prepared that they need to support you in being able to bring the whole context. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Solid, yeah. Solidarity, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so um, one of the things I do encourage people to do is to join political parties. I know people start <laughs> roll their eyes when I start saying that. Yes. Um, <laughs> like Hannah, it's important. Um, just different ways of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, I recognise that there are people who don't want to join political parties for whatever reason, but at the same time, um, they are the people who are making decisions in this country. Um, and if you don't join in that process, what it means is you are allowing the people who is already in power to continue to make the same decisions that they've always made. Um, and I'm, I'm in the Labor Party um, and, you know, I proudly talk to everybody about it. Um, but it actually doesn't really matter what party you join as long as you do join something. Um, and uh, sometimes you will have people who don't agree with you in the party. Um, and I've experienced that a lot. Um, but then at the same time, you start to see a little bit of change. Um, that's when you go, okay, well, at least something's changing. It's taking a long time, by the way. Um, but at yes. the same time, without those little pushes, it will never change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think one thing that we can learn from um, Penny Wong is for her to be in a party at the beginning did not support marriage equality to a point in the party where it did and, you know, things got changed for her yeah. is um, it's, it's the journey that we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a hard one, I'm yeah. sure, for her personally. But then at the same time, if we don't have more people who are willing to take on that journey, which is a hard journey, um, then it's going to be really hard um, because, I mean, I've spoken to people who um, are in the party, so 
there people people don't want to join us what do we do about it mm. um, and we don't want people to do that and I and I think that there's a lot of people in the community who do and don't know how to so there's a bit of um, yeah yeah well, it'd, be, it'd be good if the party actually stood for something and stopped being populist and and just concerned about ratings and shifting its position all over the place like that that is difficult for people who have convictions to go you know what Absolutely. I'm going to get behind you. But then tomorrow you go, no, I'm anti-marriage equality because you're towing some weird party line or I'm anti-climate. And so it's hard for people with convictions to go, I'm going to find a party and get behind yeah. it. That's why we need groups of people joining together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we need the party to stand for something well, well, so that yeah. we can join it. Because the party is the people, you see. And because yeah. like, I look at the Labour Party at the moment, um, there's a lot of um, membership that's it does not reflect the community whatsoever. Mm, so no, it's like, true. unless we we start to at least change the grassroots, we, we're not yeah. going to... So the key message over. there is, uh, and I think the message is there about politics. The Labour Party has a quota for women. Yes. There's huge challenges around that for me. It's not inclusive. Mm. And they need to have different quotas. Mm. We're, we're talking about that now. That's so, so, that's so good. So the message is, if you want to get involved in politics, but you've got to send the right message because yeah, it does yeah. not come out to the community. Yeah. It comes out that if you are part of this faction or this faction, then you'll get in. So it's challenging. But again, a, a really important point. So Bianca, what, what are some of those uh, issues for you in terms of um, your journey in your, in your life? What's kept me like, going yeah. through leadership? Yeah. I think my incredibly inflated ego has really <laughs> helped, assisted me. And I, um, I've, I, so I'm an only child from a single parent family and I never really saw my limitations. I know I'm, I'm, I'm an Arab, I was called Aboriginal growing up, you know, like oh, all kinds of racism there. And then, and then yeah, I'm, Leban I'm actually Lebanese and then uh, what is it to be Muslim? And then of course it was, it was not in fashion to be Muslim and then yeah. everything else. But I've just never really engaged in that at all like I don't care for it I'm not saying that is absolutely you know barriers for so many people and it has been a barrier for me as well in certain areas but like the sporting arena teaches something really important which yeah. if you just work hard it work doesn't hard. matter really yeah. what you're you can beat people like it doesn't yeah. matter and I've just quite well exactly like it doesn't beat matter as yeah, you can if you win. can, if you can win the boxing, yeah, yeah. Boxing. that's right. Yeah. So, I just my many different identities and fringes that I sit on. I've never ever seen them. I've I've truly, I just haven't seen them as limitations. I've never felt like a victim in any way. And so again, I just try to run my own race. And I think what's assisted me through those really tough times for my own personal battles is just being a rebel and being okay with it. Yeah. And just being really rebellious in nature and like shifting things, smashing things yeah. up, yeah. being okay to maybe be the loudest person in the room or like saying things often that maybe feeling make people shift in their chairs a little yeah. bit and yeah. being okay with that. And I recognise not everyone has the power to do that or that's just not in their nature to do that. And I recognise that. Um, I guess being gifted with this huge ego it gives, it gives me the strength to do that. And so I think my rebellious nature has kept me pushing on against many adversities, surrounding myself with just support. So if that's with my friendship circles, um, doing things that I love and value, like finding what it is that I'm passionate about and working on it every single day and recognising my self-esteem and having me, myself, I just need to love myself. Yeah. Ultimately, I don't need other people's permission or anyone else's, pat, you know, I don't need anyone to pat me on the back. I just truly need to love myself. And I think through my own journey and sporting achievements and, you know, constantly shaking things up and allowing myself to be vulnerable and being uncomfortable in places and allowing myself to grow, I've then been able to find power within myself, yeah. which has been able to allow me to push through mm -hmm. the hardest of times and also inspire other people, you know, um, if not indirectly, and also, I guess, with Hannah, just being able to take the piss because ultimately, like, who cares? You just, like, have a laugh and it's okay. Like, yeah, we yeah. take ourselves yeah. incredibly seriously. Yeah. And 
if you can't laugh, then yeah. nothing's worth it. I truly believe that. Because we're on this planet for such a short space. <laughs> let's smash it and make, yeah, let's do that. Because it is a short time that we're here to make those contributions, you know? And, uh, and I also think, I love that expression, uh, being a rebel. Because for many of us, given our heritage, we have been rebels. We've had to be rebels in order to, to lead, to go forward. Mm -hmm. I've got two more questions that I'm going to ask, but there is an opportunity for you to be part of this panel. Mm -hmm. And Sana has some cards that you might want to write a question on, and then she will pass them to me to ask the panel. So the two questions I have, one is around, uh, when I was growing up, like you, I listened on the crackly radio because we, we, we couldn't afford a TV, so I listened, listened to crackly radio to Martin Luther King. And I used to think that I was going to be Martin Luther King. This was the person I was going to become. So that's inspired me in my journey of human rights. Um, and then um, reading Angela Davis in the 70s and then other women. And because I didn't get that when I was a student, when I went out, it was so confusing because I didn't have role models, I didn't have things I could read or listen to, and it was very confusing. And um, so they gave me, so they gave me uh, that internal warmth. I felt like I was wrapped in a blanket when I read Angela Davis, and it allowed me to move forward with some of the things I was uh, doing. So my two questions, one is around what woman has inspired you? Or what writings have inspired you that we could share with the women today um, in your journey? And then the last one that you might want to think about is that we are, at, we are at the forefront of the things that you're doing. You're doing things every day and they take energy, they take your courage, they, you know, you, if you can walk away from some of those issues during the day and forget about them on your way home, be very lucky because often we don't, we take them home with us. So what self-care? could you offer to the women watching today? What do you do around self-care? Um, and uh, to keep, I mean, you know, you've got all that um, boxing and stuff. Mm. So maybe we'll start with you. Yeah. Give us an inspirational woman or piece of writing that yep. you have read that's really, you, it's really resonated with your soul. Well, when I was about 16, maybe 17, I discovered Malcolm X and he just absolutely <laughs> changed yes. my world. Sold that brothers. Yeah. And I just watched that film maybe five times. Yeah. It goes for about Beautiful. two hours. Beautiful. Um, and read some of his writing. I've quite, I, 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 I love socialist perspectives and I love reading about that. Um, but probably my latest thing is I'm subscribed to The New Philosopher and just recognising that these kind of reoccurring stories and themes around around the human condition, what it is to be alive and yeah. the internal suffering that we have has just been around forever and <laughs> it's just so interesting to have um, a ph philosophical perspective on it. Um, obviously the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as well, provides mentoring for all Muslims um, and then maybe my mum Diana who um, has fought against many conventions to be a single parent. Um, and raise me on her own is just a personal experience of what it is to fight hard for what you want um, against family convention and culture as well. And in terms of self-care, it's something that I am, I don't do enough of, 100%. And that's probably because of my perfectionist attitudes about what I have to do in order to do self-care, which is basically be perfect and achieve everything, and then I'll give myself a break. But um, I'm sure that everyone in this room can, can anyone identify with yes. that? I hope, hopefully it's that. So I, I think what I love to do is, um, this is not self-care at all, so I don't, don't take this advice, but I like to eat a whole heap of chocolate and watch endless movies, and maybe like not move around awesome. a bit. That is self-care, self -care. absolutely. Yeah, right. but then feel absolutely. horrible about myself later on, and then the, just the cycle continues, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. You do feature in a movie, don't you? Yeah, so um, actually the filmmakers here, um, Gemma, it's fine. Um, I, yeah, I was in a, a, just a, fi a feature documentary that Gemma filmed me for four years and yep. was um, just released last year. This well, year? So watch out, what we're saying is watch out for your documentary. Yeah, documentary. You know, so you'll have an opportunity to engage a little bit more and uh, that's, that's fantastic. It's a one hour, yeah, that's one hour. Yes. Well and done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can watch it. Yes, and it's bad. It's called Bam Bam the movie. Bam Bam, that's yeah. great. 
What's that? Uh, okay, so I don't really have um, a role model, well, one role model growing up. Um, it's combinations of, you know, I like bits of this person and bits of this person mm. and bits of this. Um, and so for me, uh, especially uh, being involved in, in politics, Penny Wong mm. um, is, mm. is a role model for me, for her, just watching her in, yeah. in the Senate, awesome. right? Um, yeah. Just seeing how competent she is and the skills that she's using in order to, you know, create, um, you know, asking people questions um, and be able to draw out information from mm. people is mm. actually quite amazing to watch from my perspective. Um, and also her nuance, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, cultural issues um, that she was able to bring into, mm. you know, some of her work as well. Uh, and but at the same time, I I've always liked the Chinese culture. Um, I've you know growing up, even though didn't really get a chance to um, do that at school, but at home I watch a lot of like Chinese movies and and all that. Um, so uh, Guan Yin is also. Um, is also you know there are elements of what she does um the the compassion and love and generosity um also resonates with me as well and so for me it's about how do i bring all that into the practical world so we can all you know sit around saying um love compassion <laughs> But then at the same time, well, what does that really mean? Yeah, like, right. what does compassion mean when it comes to, you know, when we, when we talk about advocating for change? Yes. Um, yes. How do we bring love into conversations around politics? You know, things like that. Um, so these are things that I, I tend to try and um, do myself because there's not a, a lot out there that I can... Um, uh, necessarily learn from um, but at the same time like I said I pull bits and pieces from people um, and just just in the Arden you know what she've done in, in in New Zealand is absolutely amazing as well just watching her and her behavior with her people um, so yeah bit, bits and pieces from different people um, in terms of self-care um, I do sound meditation yes uh, and so that keeps me grounded. Uh, and also because uh, with sound, I, I play crystal singing bowl, so I do oh, that you? on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that enables me to also wear a lot of saris. <laughs> um, so having that element uh, with the bowls, like sometimes I just do that at home just for my own benefit. Um, yeah, no, well, no one else in the room, but um, just for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hannah. So, what was the question again? So, oh, if there is a... I know, uh, it's... Uh, thank you. That were great yeah, stories. Was just uh, so nurturing. So, if there's a, a woman or a piece of writing that has mentored you and self-care, how do you look after um, yourself? Interestingly, you say Angela Davis, because she's somebody who was formative in my thinking and... Um, began to speak to finding my place in a world where we were on the margins and spoke to a whole host of issues. But then even today, Angela Davis, Davis as a oh. motto, oh, I'm changing the things I cannot accept. Um, so even as a philosophy, she's so relevant today. So it's not a person, but it's more sayings who yes. continue to resonate yes. and continue to inspire. Um, with that... Islam, when I talk about Islam and, and um, finding solace inside, um, and it's both self-care as well as inspiration, and both of which are found for me, not inside Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, although, you know, that was the practical revelation of Islam and people kind of focus too much on that. Um, but it is the, the understanding of the world and that we are transitioning through and... Um, and that it was and came to be through the expression of what I think is the ultimate form of justice and accountability. And that, to me, that's my currency. Wherever I can resonate with somebody's call to justice is where I find not only solace and healing, but also rejuvenation. Mm, yeah, I like that. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. Now, we're going to have some questions from, I hope I can read your writing, from the panel. I've got my glasses on here. 
Um, so the first question is, uh, where a migrant woman should start her journey to feel that she belongs to a country, a new society, or a new world sometimes? How do you deal with, is that, whoever wrote that question? Are there two questions on here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, the first one is different to the second one. Yeah, so, so where, uh, where, where, where a woman should start her journey to feel that she belongs? How do you, how do you, how do you develop a sense of belonging? Be it to a new country, a new community, and a new society. It's because we've all, ta I've taken that step, you've taken that, some of you have taken that step. Um, when you look back, for me, it was interesting because I put my step into Perth mm. in the 80s, late 80s. And there were, we used to say you could count the number of Africans on two hands because it was very different. Mm. So for me, my step was to go out and find other people and form the first African Community Association mm. and join with them in solidarity. Mm. Um, that was for me and the ANC support group. So I was in, always in the ANC support group in England. So for me, the African National Congress fighting against apartheid. It was political connection at the grassroots. Mm. So that, that, that gave me my step. Actually, it gave me my foundation, really. Mm. I was very lucky. So what was it, what was it for you? You were, you were, you know. Well, I'm, I'm actually born in Saudi Arabia, but I, um, my, my grandfather migrated in the 50s. So I was born over there, um, but I'm from Lebanon. So, I think I've found belonging in connection and I know that's like a really vague and very open term but connection for me has been connecting to my faith I think yes because I just I truly believe that the best connection and I understand that political and and conflicts and you know being able to come together based on finding for a cause is really important I also find that coming from a space of inner love and wanting to share love with other people, which I, I recognise, you know, fighting for conflict can do as well. I just think that the connections in my life has given me belonging and it's given me confidence. So the more confidence I have, the more belonging I can have with even the smallest of group, even if that's like four people, because I'm very confident within myself. It's in default. I feel like I have a lot of belonging and, you know, trying to live my life according to my values, and that always, always just reinstates my self-worth, which then I think is really contagious. I think self-worth is contagious. Yes, I think it's is. a really yes. beautiful thing. Yes. I think the more people that love themselves, it yeah. just kind of spreads across. Mm, yeah. Just the same way as anxiety and fear and anger can also be contagious. Mm. I think the more that we can just build upon those yeah, other value systems, yeah. it just... Yeah. Thank you. And then it creates community, and then you can just feel really happy about yourself that you've created community. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I like that. That's a, a really strong, powerful message. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And I think um, from my perspective, belonging is a journey. Um, so I guess, you know, the question around, you know, what you, what you should actually do in the first instance, especially when you're a new arrival. And I, I agree with you, Maria, about joining associations um, that has very similar backgrounds, whatever that could be. Um, could be race, it could be um, ethnicity, it could be religion, it could be political um, mm. understanding. It could even be just social, like, interests. Um, so I think that helps um, people uh, understand society um, in, in, you know, in, uh, understand a new place in a, in a, in a culturally sensitive manner, I suppose. Um, but then at the same time, um, that could then, you know, when, when a person is uh, found, their, uh, found their feet, um, they can actually venture out into understanding um, other groups and um, feeling belong in themselves. Um, I think at the end of the day, it, it does come back to the self. Um, mm. Because I think without uh, understanding your own belonging and belonging in the self, uh, it's really, really difficult then to um, feel belong in, in any circumstances. Because even if you've been here for um, 20, 30 years, if you don't belong in yourself, you, you could still feel not belong um, and feel like, you know, you don't have a ground. Yeah, and that... A lot of women and young women that I connect with have that feeling, and particularly when you are biracial, you come from 
a diverse background yourself. Um, and they'll often say, you know, I'm Anglo-Somali, for example, and they'll often say, well, which side do you connect with? Well, both sides. And you have to acknowledge that's the reality of your life and going back to what you feel is important, mm. you know. Mm. And I'm very lucky because, you know, often if you are mixed race, you are rejected by one. And I think I was more rejected by the English side than the Somali side. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it can, be, it can be a huge challenge when you're growing up within a family that is also racist. So, you know, you have a bigger challenge. And those women read, listening to this will have a, those from mixed race will have a much, much bigger, it's a huge challenge. Yeah, I'm understanding that, sorry. Understanding that identity as well, like identity, what, yeah. what aspects Sorry, kind of, of yeah. your own uh, upbringing or the environment yeah. that you really connect to yeah. and, and, and yeah. find that, yeah. um, mm. which, which takes, for, for a lot of people, it takes a long time. It does, I, yeah. I'm going to be a bit controversial here because, um, just because I like it. Um, <laughs> women like us uh, don't belong inside our cultures. Uh, women like us are pushing back against some of the cultural norms and when we find ourselves living in the margins of societies, um, we also are pushing back against the mainstream. So I, I think tribe and belonging and going to, if I could imagine coming into a country and trying to find myself in Islamic settings, I'd stay away from them because I found that Islam or its interpretation, not Islam, yeah. the interpretation of Islam and its rituals and institutions haven't served me well. Similarly, the interpretation of Western institutions haven't served me well because yeah. they, they're racist in its expression. So I find that for me, a sense of solace and home and um, is wherever I am. And that yeah. can be in connections that I make with anyone yes. who uh, is on the same page as me yes. in their convictions. And yes, you're never going to fully belong. This idea that you're going to find, yeah, no, we formulate our tribe and wherever that is, yeah. that it speaks to, so for me, it's about looking inward, not outward. And coming back to what you guys said earlier, that becoming aware of yourself and who you are and, and kind of standing firm in that and then seeking uh, wherever those connections are real. And in the moment, that is where home is. It's not ever going to be a geography or a group of people because they are as diverse and succumbing to this idea that biracial or triracial or whatever. Like to me, sometimes I have much more in common with... Um, um, no, rarely do I have anything in common with Netanyahu, but I was trying to think of somebody who's so far removed from, from culturally who we are. But do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know the what you mean, that is, connection. That's the yeah, connection that, at the time. And absolutely. The home. And, yeah. and That's so, a really good point. So ident and identity yeah. then becomes formed yeah. as we go. Yeah. We're creating new identities as we yeah. go. Yeah. And and succumbing to the limitation of those boundaries of culture and, and gender and ethnicity mm. is really problematic. Mm. Mm. And I actually like your idea of like creating our own. We're making it as yeah. we go. That's right. Yeah, I love that. And I think that for me feels, you know, I'm really pleased that you highlighted that because it does it does for me remind us of you know the notion of. The different tribes that we belong to and we do you know yeah absolutely um and it's okay um you know sometimes it's a struggle for many of us but it's it's actually okay so thank you for that it's really mm -hmm. special and can I just add on to that as well is that i think because we've had to fight so hard yes. you almost just <laughs> like you just accept that you don't you almost accept that you're not ever going to truly belong and it's okay. Yeah. And you just have to find peace with that. And I think that the more confidence and higher self-esteem you have, you just find belonging within yourself. Yes. And that's also okay. That's okay. And that, but where you do have the, those moments of connection and belonging, you know, uh, take them in and relish, you know, yeah. and celebrate yeah. them because, you know. Like we belong here right now. Yeah, absolutely. We won't belong Feel great here. here. This is fantastic. <laughs> exactly. here right now. Yeah. And at the Harmony Alliance, yeah. I think yeah. that, you know, the Harmony that, Alliance, the Harmony yeah. Alliance connecting. The Harmony Alliance. Uh, yeah. So this is a really, really beautiful uh, question. And we, we, um, we, how much, we might finish on this, if, unless anyone's got another burning question. Uh, and it is, have you thought about the legacy you are uh, going to leave or you're creating? Uh, what legacy do you want to leave? 
It's like, and it's like, it's like I, I remember reading that book, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, it really struck me when somebody said, you know, you've got, if you, if you are buried and there is a tombstone, what, what would you like written on it about you? Oh, that's a really intense question. A slightly so. better world for, for everybody, especially women and girls who find themselves um, the most vulnerable, regardless of religious or social or societal institutions. So mm. contributing even one iota to creating that, that's all I want. Yes, mm. thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, it's a great question, by the way. Um, I think for me, um, it's about authentic power, yeah. um, finding, um, helping people find their own authentic power, whatever that could be, um, especially for women. When we, when we work in this masculine world, um, when we look at leadership, it's, it's this masculine way of being a leader, which doesn't necessarily connect with us um, as, as uh, women. And also, especially if you come from a different cultural background, that could add another layer of difference. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I guess, you know, if I, I really want to leave this world with a legacy would be about helping people understand that their own authentic power is who they are. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Rosa. It's such a scary like question because it feels like you got like one foot in the grave and you're like, <laughs> my, it's imminent, my death is imminent. Well, the legacy that I would hope to leave is that it's okay to smash stereotypes. I started off with that, <laughs> so that's okay. Um, and being unique is a really beautiful thing. Don't ever feel like you're a weirdo. It's completely fine to be any version of yourself. The importance of really working hard, I think, is just so incredibly important, everything you do. And whatever battle that you may be fighting against, everyone's got their unique battles going on and we should always, always support each other. I just think that connection and kindness is incredibly important towards us, each other and, and towards our environment. I mean, I've just left New South Wales, it's burning right now and it's because yeah. we have disrespected our environment, we do not care yeah. for it. So I just hope that we can be um, more kind to each other and, and, and to the environment. Yeah, yeah. Kindness to, to ourselves, to others and the land that we stand on. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd just like to thank Bianca and Hannah and Wessa for your beautiful insights. And uh, I feel really connected to you after that, so it's really special. And uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, podcast for the Harmony Alliance. Mm -hmm. And I know that the women tuning in will get a lot from it and they can follow it up with other information that we're going to provide so thank you and that's you. over and out from us can i can i just add one thing as i always try to um <laughs> just leaving with the question not not why are things as awful as they are um i mean if we have won a legacy it's why aren't things better and how do we make them better yes um, rather than focusing on how only, how and yeah. why they so why? awful. And I think that was JFK who said that. Yeah. Or that was his sentence. Mm. Anyway. Great. Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.